necessary to, to make GPS work. But I want to give you a, an overview of, of why that is. So I'm not going to be able to present coherent uh, theories of special relativity and general relativity, but I want to just give you a, a sense of, of those things so that maybe you can explain it to, to your students in a, in a rough way. Okay, so GPS has completely revolutionized uh, lots, as, lots of aspects of, uh, of transportation these days. Many of us will have GPS in our Cars. Some cars are already built with GPS these days. And uh, they have lots of uh, applications, not just with navigation, but also in terms of uh, search and rescue, um, uh, keeping track of pets and, and prisoners. Uh, but of course, military applications, uh, navigation, your jet, jets these days all rely on GPS heavily. So what's the, uh, the idea of GPS? Well, it was a system that was introduced uh, by the U.S. military in the uh, 70s. So GPS started out uh, with the U.S. Defense Department. And I guess the original prototype was sort of in the 1970s, and then uh, I guess it got going sort of as a commercial uh, thing in the, in the 1990s. And uh, the idea is that uh, we're going to try to locate position. So the aim is to locate your position with a little receiver that you have. And to, to help us, we have these uh, satellites which are going around. And there are, in fact, 24 satellites. So 24 satellites in six orbits around the Earth. These six orbits are inclined at uh, roughly 55 degrees to the equator. Okay. So there's sort of one orbit like this, maybe another one. So you can imagine six different orbits, and uh, each one of these orbits has uh, four satellites on it. And these uh, satellites are, are going around. And they're, how high are they? They're roughly, the altitude is, um, is about 20,000 kilometers. I remind you that the radius of the Earth is about 6,000 kilometers. I'll just be using approximate figures uh, in this topic. Okay, so they're reasonably uh, up there, but not all that far. And how fast do they go? Well, they go, they travel around uh, 14,000 kilometers per hour. And that means that they make one circumnavigation every 12 hours. They go around once in 12 hours. Contrary to some public uh, perception that they're actually uh, geosynchronous orbit, okay? no, they're actually moving around. So 12 hours afterwards, they're in, uh, in the same position. Now. Okay, what's the idea? Well, you are somewhere with your little receiver, and the positions of these orbits are such that 
at least four of them are visible at any point on the planet at any given time. So four, usually four to six, are visible everywhere at any time. And it's really only four of them that are needed. These uh, satellites are sending out signals with time and location information. So each satellite sends uh, time and location uh, info on certain bands. And then your receiver can pick up basically the, uh, the time and location of, say, four satellites. And with a bit of uh, working things out, basically your receiver can figure out the distances to these four satellites. So your receiver knows the distances to, say, four satellites. And that's enough to determine your position up to a certain amount of uh, accuracy. And these days it's about up to maybe uh, 5 or 10 uh, meters. 5 to 10 meters. Okay, so what's involved? Of course, these signals that are being sent are traveling at the speed of light. Okay. Because it's electromagnetic radiation. And the speed of light is a very important player in this, in this story. So most students, I hope, will know that the speed of light is roughly uh, 300,000 kilometers per second, but not per hour, per second. Okay. And uh, that means that if, if, if it was going in a, sort of around the Earth, it could probably go around the Earth about eight, seven or eight times in one second. Like generally likes to travel in straight lines, but that's just to give you a sense of how fast it's going. So it's going a lot faster than the satellites. And many students will know that, for example, the, the, the distance to the sun in terms of how far along light takes is eight minutes. It's eight minutes to uh, the sun, or from the sun to the earth. So the speed of light is, uh, is, is known, and so the idea is that uh, if you know how much time has elapsed, between uh, a signal being emitted by the satellite and your receiver receiving it, then you can easily work out the distance between the two objects. And then having four such pieces of information, we can do something called trilateration, which is a relatively simple a geometrical idea. Let me just give you the planar version of that. So the planar version is that if you know distances to three fixed points, determines position. So for example, if here are three fixed points in the plane now, and you happen to be, say, here, if you know this distance, d1, then you know that you're on some circle centered at this known point. If you also know the distance between uh, this point and yourself, say d2, it means that you're on another circle centered at this point. And those two pieces of information pin you down pretty well, except that there's another possibility out here. So you need one more piece of information to determine where you are. So if you know the third distance, say D3, from the third fixed point, then you are able to determine where you are. Okay, I might just mention that there's also a linear version of this. Simpler, but still in the same spirit. So if you have uh, an unknown point and you know that you know your distance from some fixed point, say D1, 
Well, then you could be here or you could be here. And you do need to know another distance in order to fix where you are. So you need a second distance. A D2 is really a sort of a circle, two points on, on the line. Okay, so in space, there's an obvious analog. So in space, if we have one fixed point, and we know the distance, then we know that we're on a certain sphere of radius d1, maybe there. And then if we know the distance to another fixed point, then we know that we're on another sphere, radius d2. And those two pieces of information together tell us that we're on a circle. There's a common circle over overlap of those two spheres. And then if we happen to know the distance to a, a third point, that's yet another sphere, so D3, well then uh, typically that sphere will cut that circle in two points. Okay, so maybe this one and another one. And so we need one more piece of information to pin it down where exactly we are. So once we have fourth a point, fourth satellite, and a fourth uh, distance, then we know exactly where we are. Okay, so uh, this system has, uh, well, it's relatively recent, but of course it has its origins in, in historical uh, systems. So in, in navigation on, on the oceans, which has been an important problem for many centuries, they have a system uh, that's sort of a precursor of this. So historically, there was a system called Moran, uh, which is a system of beacons for sea navigation. And that was a bit less sophisticated and uh, not requiring quite the technology uh, that, that these do. Particularly, we don't need satellites, we just need uh, beacons. So these are maybe lighthouses, for example. And here's some ocean, and you're uh, on a ship somewhere, and you'd like to know where you are. So the uh, Loran system is uh, designed so that these, these clocks, or these, these beacons, uh, send out beams at regular intervals. You know, maybe uh, every on the hour or every every minute or something like this. You know. At regularly known intervals, they send out uh, beams. So at say 11 o'clock, a beam is sent out from this station, and at exactly 11 o'clock, another beam is sent out at this station. And your receiver gets these two signals, and it, there's no t exact time information. There's no t piece of information on the signal saying that this co this is coming from 11 o'clock. But and, and, you, and you don't know how long it took to get there. What you do know is the difference in the, in the, dip, in the uh, times that you're getting this signal to this signal. You get one signal, the 11 o'clock signal from that beacon, and then you know maybe a, a tenth of a second later you get the signal from the other beacon. So you know the difference in times. So the difference in times Then you can plot because you know that if you have two points, that the locus of the points whose difference in the, between the distances, between those two points, that's a hyperbola. Uh, foci, maybe, f1, f2. So a hyperbola like this is characterized by many properties, but one of them is that, say, that distance d1 minus that distance d2 is some constant. That's analogous to the familiar property for an ellipse. That's determined, uh, determined an ellipse that tells you that it's given by condition d1 plus d2 equals constant for an ellipse. Difference of distance. Okay, so if you know the, the differences in times, it, telling you that you can plot on your, on your map uh, two hyperbolas, or a one hyperbola, and you know that you're on this hyperbola. 
somewhere. And then if you use the other beacons, well, then you get uh, another hyperbola from those two. And then if you want to use this one here, you get another, another one. And, and then you can plot your position from where these th three or two hyperbolas meet. There's an interesting variant on, on this, which was used in World War I. So in, in World War I, there was all kinds of artillery that was buried in strategic places and it was hard to, to find. So one way of, um, of finding out where the enemy gun positions were was to get yourself three hills and put uh, audio receivers uh, on here. This is sort of the opposite. Now, when the signal is being sent by a gun, there's some enemy gun that's firing off at your position in some unknown place. And you want to find out where that gun is so that you can train your guns on it to knock it out. Okay, so how are you going to do that? Well, every time the gun goes off, a, a noise signal is emitted, and these can be picked up by these, these receivers. And if the receivers have clock, just calibrated, then the difference in times that they receive those signals um, can be computed. And that will tell them that this gun, wherever it is, must be on some hyperbola. And so you can play the same game, uh, sort of backwards, to find out where that, that gun is, and then hopefully knock it out. <laughs> OK. So uh, that's. Uh, the, the rough ideas of GPS, and let's talk a little bit about um, about the speed of light, which, which is very important. So there's there's two uh, technical things that are that are happening here that are important. So at, at, on the one hand, level the speed of light is very fast. On the other hand, the clocks that you have to use in order to make this GPS work have to be very fine. They have to be really good clocks. So on board these satellites, there are these atomic clocks. And they are, they are good to within a few nanoseconds per day. Okay, these, are, these are cesium uh, clocks uh, that were developed in the 1950s uh, that use properties of cesium uh, electrons going from one state to another. And so there's, there's very... Uh, very clear and, and precise measurement, time measurements that can be uh, made of these things. So these atomic clocks are good to about, say, four nanoseconds per day. Okay, what's a nanosecond? Well, nano means one billionth, so nano is like one billionth. And so uh, that's. Uh, 10 to the minus 9 uh, seconds. OK, so if you um, multiply, or of course, this, this is an important formula. Velocity equals distance over time is a key formula. And, or otherwise, d equals vt. So if we're talking about an error of a couple of nanoseconds, and the velocity is the speed of light, then we're talking about an error in distance, which is of the order of tens of centimeters. Okay, so this, the, the clock's inaccuracy amounts to, so in one nanosecond, light goes this far, 30 centimeters, roughly. That's one nanosecond, one billionth of a second. Okay, so if, you, if your clocks are off by, you know, a millionth of a second, it's, it's quite serious in terms of wanting to be, wanting to know where that, uh, that uh, T on the, the golf course uh, is, you know, where the hole is. I have friends who tell me that they use their GPS. They can figure out where the hole is on the, on the green or the next uh, green in front of them, aiming their mobile phones or whatever. <laughs> so nanoseconds are important. And at four nanoseconds, it is, is quite all right. But there is another problem, uh, a bigger technical issue, which is uh, perhaps quite surprising. And that's that relativistic effects 
uh, creep in. And it turns out that Einstein's theory of relativity relativity theories, and there's a, a plural there for good reason, okay, that these actually directly connect with this, uh, this situation for two reasons. First of all, that the satellites are going reasonably fast. Yeah, they're not going really fast, but they're going pretty fast, because they're going around 20,000 kilometers up there, and they're going around in 12 hours. It's pretty fast. And the second thing is that they're, they're quite high up. So it turns out that both of Einstein's theories of relativity, and there's two of them, but we'll talk about that in a second, they introduce errors into this story. If you did not account for Einstein's theories of relativity, you would get errors of between 7 and 45 milliseconds. Millisecond being one millionth of a second. So that's a... Uh, you know, a millisecond is a thousand times as big as a, as a nanosecond. So if we didn't deal with this, and if we ignored special relativity and said, ah, oh, who cares about special relativity, our GPS in a, just a, in a few hours would be out of whack, and in a few days would be essentially useless. So uh, the engineers have to understand the special relativity and the general relativity, and how it how it inputs, and they have to adjust the atomic clocks uh, to, to make it work. And what they do is, they, it turns out that you need to slow down the uh, atomic clocks. The atomic clocks run too fast up there, and so what they do is they recalibrate them before they send them up in their satellites. They, they, they work out how much they recalibrate them, and they make them run slower down here on planet Earth, so that when they get up there in orbit, they're running on time. Okay, so I want to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, these these theories of relativity and, you know, what do they have to do with this situation and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rather interesting because there's these two theories of relativity and they actually work in opposite directions in this situation. Any questions? Yes, they do. So um, the U.S. military only allots a certain fraction of the, the whole use for commercial uses, and they reserve the greater amount of accuracy for themselves. So you, they, 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 can, they can produce more accuracy than, than, than your GPS can. So there's only one set of satellites that are providing GPS? Yeah, there's one system, one system of 24 satellites. That's so the Chinese don't have their own system. Well, the, the Chinese and the Russians and so on, they're all they're developing or have developed their own sort of systems, but they're not in wide use yet. You know, but they will be used by their militaries. And it may, it may very well be that in future years they will become more standard in those other countries. And the uh, American people <coughs> built in inaccuracies into their GPSs so that uh, they can't be used by opposition militaries? They, 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 yeah, they're, they're, uh, I mean, to get down to a centimeter thing, I'm not sure if they, if they do that. You, you might, it, might be, it, might be, it might be the case. Uh, you probably don't know. Well, um, you know, but these things might be suggested, but I'm not sure if that's, that's the case. Yeah. How big is a satellite? Well, I don't think they're very big. You know, about this big, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this size. I, I, it's my guess. They're not that, that big. It's not that they're not that small either. And sort of, what sort of lifespan do they have, like, going around? Well, there's. I, I, I think probably my guess is you know a half a dozen years. Oh, okay. Um, be just my guess. There are some spares that are floating around. Yeah. In, along, along with the twenty-four, there's a few, maybe half a dozen spares that are going around. So if one cocks out. They can boot up another one, and they're they're constantly being sort of recalibrated and, uh, and probably brought brought down and <coughs> refitted every. And, and they belong there 
Earth? They belong to the US. Earth? They belong to the US. US. Is there another 24 that belong to China and another 48 that belong to Russia? No, so the, 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 space I, I'm not sure what the funding is. The funding is probably getting funding from different places. So I'm not an expert on this, okay? But I mean, overall, the U.S. military will still, or the U.S. Defense Department will still sort of run, run the show. Okay. Um, but you know, they, it's in their interests. Um, does everybody have a few satellites up there at 55 degrees blue cable? Oh yeah, there's lots of other satellites. There's lots of other satellites too. Yeah. Because you know, there, there's other satellites used for other things. Yeah. For, for sure. This is, these are just for the positioning system, not for transmitting TV or, or anything like that. Is there a reason that 55 degrees? Sorry? That 55 degrees. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it's just so that we get reasonably good coverage. I mean, you could imagine if the angle was too, too shallow, that it would be concentrated too much along the equator. So that's a way of getting a reasonable distribution around the ground. So it's an interesting geometric problem. All right, so let's talk about uh, Albert Einstein. And uh, so the dominant scientists of modern times. And these two remarkable theories that he, he developed. So in 1905, there was the special theory of relativity. And then he thought hard for another 10 years and came up with the general theory of relativity. So sometimes just special relativity in general. And uh, a special, the special theory of relativity concerns uh, observers which are in uniform motion with respect to each other. It's, it's talking about what the world looks like from the point of view of observers in relative uniform motion. While the general relativity uh, deals with observers which are accelerated. So acceleration, accelerated frames, and Einstein realized that crucially that that's really the, almost the same as a gravitational observers in gravitational fields. Okay, so the, the special theory has its origins uh, in the work of, of Maxwell and his equations of, for electromagnetism. And it was probably in the air at the time. There were a fair number of other mathematicians who were pretty close to understanding things. Some of the basic laws are due to Lorentz, a very prominent uh, physicist, and, and Poincaré, very important. So, so there was sort of a sense that this was in the air, but Einstein was the one who, who could see clearly through, through, the, through the things and, and figure out what it was going on. The general theory, there's really, it's just a complete work of, of genius. Um, unprecedented, completely transforming physicist's understanding of, of the world in which we live in. And it's a little bit unfortunate that these two theories haven't made it more in the popular press. I mean, they're really fabulously interesting things that affect our, our world our world view so much. Um, and even in mathematics courses, we don't we don't pay enough attention to these uh, things. So I want to give you a, a very brief kind of uh, overview of them and uh, tell you how they very very much affect uh, these uh, GPS systems. Okay. So um, the special theory really started with a key experiment. Okay? It was an experiment of Michelson and Morley around the turn of the, the 20th century that determined that um, you have the Earth, there it is, and it's, uh, it's spinning, of course, spinning around its axis. And, um, and they're interested in the speed of light. How fast is the speed of light? It's 300,000 kilometers per second. So they said, let's, let's try to measure the speed of light uh, in two different directions. Let's measure it going this way, and let's measure it going this way. We should obviously get different answers, because the Earth itself is spinning. And so if you're measuring the uh, velocity of a train, and you yourself are in a car going with the train, 
you expect that your measurements could be different if you're, than if you're going in some transverse direction. So they fully expected. They were interested in how much difference there was going to be. And remarkably, they discovered that there was no difference. There was no difference. And since then, people have, have tried all kinds of other different experiments. And it turns out that <coughs> if you're a person on the ground, or you're on a rocket ship going 200, uh, uh, well, let's make 200,000 kilometers per second, you're going very fast in that direction. Or you're in a rocket ship going a little bit slower, maybe 100,000 kilometers per second. And you're watching a photon, which is zipping by. So here's a photon, which is going by at C equals 300,000 kilometers per second. Well, 300,000 kilometers per second with respect to what? Well, with, with respect to the person on the Earth. So the person on the Earth has well, seen this photon going by 300,000. Most of us would say, well, already, if you're going 200,000, you're observing this thing, you're going to see that this thing is going 100,000 more faster than you are. And if you're in this one here, you're going to see that thing coming at you at, at a, a huge clip because it's coming in the opposite direction. So you know, it's, a, it's a relative velocity of 500,000. It's going to look like it's coming really fast at you. But the fact of the world is that all three observers measure exactly the same speed for that light. That is just the way the world is. That's the consequence of Michael Morley's um, experiment. And it's really the, the key idea that made Einstein say, well, what's, what's going on here? So in other words, another way of thinking about it is that these relative positions, or relative velocities, are really just relative. This person thinks he's stationary, and these guys are moving, but equally you could take the frame of reference of one of these ones and say, I'm stationary and everybody else is moving. So a consequence of this is that there is no fixed frame of reference for the world. At least no observable ones. And the 20th century physicist has the attitude, well, if it's not, if it's not observable, then we may as well suppose it doesn't really exist. So, in other words, our, our naive idea that there's sort of space out there we went out in space, the space is just sitting there, and we're moving within that space. Okay. It's not so simple. There's, there's no <coughs> fixedness about anything. Maybe this is clear uh, now, these days, because our understanding of the universe is so much more than it was uh, in, in Michael Samoy's day. Nowadays, we know that okay, we have the planet Earth, and Earth is rotating around, and it's also zipping around the sun. Okay, so, so we, if, we're, if we're sitting here in this room thinking, oh, it's nice and solid, we're not, we're not moving. Actually, we're, we're zipping around on the Earth because we're being rotated by the, the Earth, and we're also massively flying around the sun. But the sun is just one of a <coughs> bunch of stars in the Milky Way, and it's probably moving with respect to those other stars. The whole Milky Way is some, some big conglomeration of half a trillion stars, and it's spiraling around in some way. So the sun itself is moving. And then the Milky Way is one of a number of trillions of galaxies, and there are clusters and superclusters of galaxies, and they're all moving with respect to each other. So this idea of that there being a fixed point of reference that we can use as a coordinate system is just too simple-minded. And Einstein said, okay, so let's do physics, physics this way. Let's try to understand the world, really grappling with this, uh, the consequences of this idea. All right, so what are the consequences of this idea? Well, so let's, let's uh, simplify things a little bit, and let's pretend we're in outer space somewhere, and uh, we have some directions. Maybe uh, here's an x direction, and a y direction, z direction. <clears throat> okay, this is from our point of view. Here, here we are at A. Okay. 
Okay. We are in a, maybe a little spaceship here or something like this. Here we are at A, and we sort of think, well, we're stationary. Okay, and here's our x-axis and our y-axis, our z-axis. So let's let's just ask, them, how do we describe, or let's say let's say at some point where we're we're watching things, and uh, maybe we have a clock, maybe it's like an atomic clock. Okay, we need clocks in this story, and the simplest clocks are ones that are generated by light. So, uh, but one way of getting a clock is just to get a, a bunch of mirrors that parallel and let light bounce back and forth. Every time it goes up, it's a tick. Every time it goes down, it's a tock. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Mm -hmm. So that's our clock. Okay. And um, okay, and we don't have actually. It's not a physical axis here. This is just empty space. But let's say at some point, some some neighboring Klingon ship or something comes comes over here, and then there's an explosion at some point in time, and then it flies off again. How would we say what the position and the time of that event? are. Well, it's just a question of seeing. So we would, let, we would see that explosion. What does that mean? Well, it means that at an earlier point, um, well, what it means is that when there is an explosion, light comes in, okay, and we, we see it. But we have to take into consideration how far we think that thing is, is away from us. It's, it's hard to tell how far something is away from us. So uh, a better way is to actually for us to shine a light on that thing. So if we shine a light on it, and the light just happens to get there when the Klingon is doing whatever he's doing, and then bounces back, then we can get a pretty good idea of when and where in our system that explosion took place. For example, suppose that uh, we sent out a beam at, say, t equals 2. At our, our time t equals 2, and we receive this beam back at time t equals uh, like 6. What can we conclude about uh, this situation? Where, where did the thing happen? Well, all together, uh, there's four units of time that have gone. And let's organize our, our scales, or our units, so that in one unit of time, uh, c equals c goes so one unit of length. Okay, so, so in other words, we'll, we'll choose our units not as kilometers and seconds, but as some other units so that c actually is one. So that means that uh, altogether there's four time periods that have gone, so two out and two in. And we can deduce that this took place at position two minus. That make sense? Four units all together have, 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 have transpired between the in and the out. So it's gone two units this way and two units this way because length and time are being Corresponding here. So that's the sort of the position, x equals 2. And what is the time at which that explosion took place? Well, we sent the beam out at 2 and we got it back at 6. So the explosion was exactly halfway in between those two times because it takes as much time to go in and out. So the explosion took place at time t equals 4. So we could say that these are the coordinates. Okay, I'm ignoring x and uh, y and z. So these are the coordinates of this event. And Einstein realized that this idea of assigning coordinates to, to space and time is a very relative notion. And that if you had a second spaceship going along, say, B, then that spaceship's measurements of time and the space would be uh, quite different. And that certain strange things uh, would result if we, if we agree that no one coordinate system was preferred over another. That the laws of physics had to be the same in both A system and B system. Uh, well, uh, well, Einstein's 
way of interpreting the consequences of the Michelson Morley experiment. The laws of physics have to be the same as long as these guys are going uh, with uniform motion relative to each other. Okay, so there's various consequences of that. So various consequences are that simultaneity is a relative notion. Let me try to explain that in the following. Suppose I'm going to, I'm going to do two events. I'm going to snap my fingers. Okay? I'm going to snap my left fingers and then my right fingers. Okay, so let me do that. Okay, so here's what the left finger snap, and now there's the right finger snap. Now I would say that those two events took place at different times, but they took place at the same position. But you can see that that's a relative statement. That's only true in our reference frame. You all agree with me. But that's because you're not considering that actually we're hurtling through space as we're being revolved by the, uh, the Earth's rotation and going around the sun. In fact, when I, when I snap my fingers <clears throat> the first time with the left hand, some time elapsed. And in that time, I've act we've actually been moving dramatically. You know, we're now hundreds of thousands of kilometers away from where we were before, the whole room has moved, and then I snap my, my, my right hand. The fact is, we are not in the same position as we, we think we are. Okay? So it appears as if these are in the same places, but they're not. And you can sort of understand that. What's harder to understand is that there's no corresponding notion of same time. Okay? The idea that two events happen at the same time is a relative notion. All right, so let me try to illustrate that with a diagram. This is a different kind of diagram. This is a diagram that Minkowski, who was a pal of Einstein, uh, sort of introduced to try to understand special relativity. He said, let's try to graph position and time on the same, in the same coordinate system. Okay? So well, I'm going to ignore the y and z coordinates. I'm only interested in what's happening in the x-coordinate. And here, here, this is our reference frame, A's reference frame. So, these points here are all points of the form x0. These are all time t equals 0. That means, from A's point of view, they're all simultaneous to A. What does that mean? Well, it means that, as far as our clock goes, remember we have this clock that's going tick-tock. Okay. So we can, we can uh, we have time ticking, talking, uh, so we can calibrate the time axis very clearly. So suppose that time t equals minus 2, we sent out a beam of light in this direction. Of course, in the one dimension, it looks like it's going like this, but in the two-dimensional coordinate system, it's actually going like this. It's going at a speed of 1, so its slope is 1. And suppose that at this point here it's reflected because there's a, an exposure or something and it comes back. It's going to come back at t equals 2. The average of those, the average uh, midpoint between when we set it out and when we received it, is what we, what we think is going to be the time value. That's the same calculation that we did over there. And so we can say that all of these points have that same property. If we send a, a signal out from minus 3, it will get to that event and then come back at time 3. So that this is also, this would be 3, 0. This would be 2, 0. These, all these events are, are simultaneous, or at t equals 0 for us. Okay, now I want you to imagine, from, still from A's point of view, here's our friend B, who's on a rocket ship. And B is, is zooming uh, this way. But we're going to plot his trajectory in this space-time picture. So at time t equals 0, he's there. And then at time t equals 1, um, oh no, time t equals 1, uh, let's say he's gone there. So he's actually, that actually corresponds to his position there. So his trajectory is something like this. Now he also has a little clock, exactly the same kind of clock we have on board. 
And he also is making measurements just like we have to determine simultaneity. So let's see what would happen with his clock. So let's, let's put to his clock, uh, his ticks and talks, like this. What would happen if he sent out a signal at, at his time minus one? Okay, well the signal is still going to be going to the speed of light, so it has to move parallel to these lines of slope one, still a line of slope one. So this is a story of a light beam that's leaving here at minus one and coming back at plus one. And so part, our, our explorer B deduces that from his point of view, this point has exactly the same property as this point did in our system. The amount of time before and the amount of time after receiving the signals are equal. So he deduces that this event and this event are at the same time for him. So his time equals zero looks like this. So his, here is his uh, x axis, which is like x prime, and here is his t axis. And you can see that simultaneity for him is different from simultaneity for us. He thinks these two events are simultaneous. We think these two events are simultaneous. We can clearly see that this event here happened after this event. Okay, another consequence is that length gets shortened. Length, well, there's two, two different things. So time, time dilation. Moving clocks appear to run slower. And it's a very simple um, geometrical thing. So um, what it is is, I'll let this do it, single dimension, x, back in space. Here we are at A with our clock, going tick tock. Here comes our friend uh, B. Who's in a spaceship? Who also has a clock, exactly like our clock, manufactured by exactly the same company to the same specifications. Okay. Uh, but B is going at some speed in this direction, and we're watching. We're A. And we're watching this B's clock, and we're going to phone him up and say, B, I think you have a problem. Your clock is not going uh, the right way. Why would we think that? Because if we watch his clock, uh, I'm going to make a little picture. If we actually watch this beam of light that's emitted from down here and bounces up here and then comes back. What we're going to see is a picture that looks like this. When the light is emitted down here, this this part of the bottom clock is there. But by the time the light gets up here, his whole ship has moved forward to that position. So his tick and talk, well, this, this amount is still the same as, uh, as ours. But now he has to go, this light has to go over a hypotenuse of this right triangle rather than just up the vertical. For us, it was just going from here to here. But we can clearly see that his, his light beam had to go further than our light beam. It took longer. So, we might say, okay, you know, what was one second for us, and we're saying, look, your clock is out of balance. It's taking 1.5 seconds to, to go from tick-tock. Your clock appears slower. Is this really true? Well, yes it is. If you take a GPS satellite and you look at these atomic clocks that are up here, they're going relative to us on planet Earth. They're, they're moving relatively fast. They are ticking slower. These tick slower by 7 milliseconds per day.
So special relativity, this time dilation, is telling us that we're going to have to adjust for the fact this is a rather significant number, even though it appears like a relatively small number, but you know, if you think about how far light goes in that time, it's still a relatively reasonable uh, leaping. But there is also Einstein's general theory of relativity. So let me very quickly give you some idea of that. So Einstein's general theory of relativity was motivated by a, a certain thought that he had, which he called the happiest thought of his life. And Einstein's happiest thought was one day he was thinking about these various things, and he realized that if somebody was falling, say, in an elevator, let's say the elevator was just dropped and he was falling, that that person couldn't tell whether he was Free, falling in a gravitational field, or whether he was freely floating in space. You may have seen this wonderful movie, Gravity, with Sandra Bullock. Yeah. It's fabulous. You should encourage all your students to, to watch it, I think. Because it teaches us a lot about, it, about relativity in space. But anyway, they're, you know, they're floating around there like this with, uh, with no gravity. And Einstein realized that falling and being in a gravi and being falling freely in a gravitational field is really the same as as being as not being accelerated somewhere out in free space. Or another way of putting this is that acceleration is really the same as uh, a gravitational force. In other words, if you're in a box somewhere in the universe and you're feeling gravity, like we are now, there are two possibilities. Possibility one is that you are sitting on some big planet, and it's the mass of that planet which is making us heavy. Possibility two is that you are actually in a rocket ship, which is accelerating. Thrusters are on, and, you're, and the G forces are making you, making everything go down to the bottom. And Einstein's equivalence principle basically says that there's no way of telling these two situations apart. Yeah, it's, not, it's a kind of relativity, but it's it's a different kind of relativity. There's no experiment that you can do to try to figure out whether you're in the gravitational field of a planet or whether you're accelerating due to some rocket thrusters. Well, that's like you can hear the, the, the planet, or you, or you can look out your window and see you know, the children playing. Okay, so that means the laws of physics are going to be the same. So, one of the consequences of, uh, of this is, is the following, that if you were in a rocket ship, okay, so let's take this rocket ship, and let's suppose that you have yourself down here, and your friend is up here on some ledge, and you're both shining light at each other. And you're in this rocket ship, which is being uh, accelerated this way. Think about what happens to these, these two beams of light. So the first one, uh, the first beam of light, the, the, the ship is actually being accelerated. So um, you, you've shot, you've shot the, the, the light at the photon is, is going, but in the meantime, this one is moving further away from where the photon is. It's what the astronomers call a Doppler effect. A Doppler effect uh, takes place, and, and this, this light appears red-shifted. It's the same phenomena that we, get, that we can tell from how far distant galaxies are. The ga galaxies are moving away from us, and so the light that we're getting from them is red-shifted. That's telling us that they're moving away. So this, this guy is going to say, your light is red-shifted. On the other hand, this guy is going to, you know, the, the, the photon coming here, he's going to be coming up to beat that photon. So he's going to see it blue-shifted. He's going to see this light blue-shifted, which is the higher frequency. And they're both going to agree on this effect. It's not that one of them is going to say red and they're both going to say no. They're both going to agree this light is red shifted, this light is blue shifted. 
Now, what that means is, according to the, the relativity equivalence principle, that the same phenomena is going to happen if you are in a gravitational field. If you have someone in a satellite and you shoot light at him, he will think your light is redshifted. If you see uh, the satellite, if you look at the light coming from the satellite, you're going to think it's blue shifted because these two situations are entirely equivalent. And what that means is that, so the, the frequency of the wave, okay, here it's a longer wave, and here it's a sort of a shorter wave. The frequency of a wave can be thought of as like a clock. And what you can deduce from here is that the clock here is running slower than the clock here. That's a consequence of the equivalence principle and understanding the Doppler effect in an accelerating rocket ship. So the, the conclusion is that clocks higher up, higher in a uh, gravitational field, run faster. And by how much? We're talking about the satellites, which are up there with our GPS systems. The amount is about 45 milliseconds per day. So while special relativity is suggesting that the clocks, or telling us that the clocks are going slower, general relativity is saying that those clocks up there are going faster because they're higher up in the gravitational field. And we can calculate the difference. There's 45 here and there was 7 here. So for a, a total, the total thing is that the, the clocks in the GPS satellites run faster by 45 minus 7 equals 38 milliseconds per day. And if we didn't adjust for that, then our GPS wouldn't work, and you wouldn't be able to figure out uh, you know, how to get uh, from here to Hornsby. Um, all of those things wouldn't work. It's an essential fact of things, and it's a kind of remarkable, I think, interesting thing that you can tell your students about. And uh, the underlying reasons are relatively, you know, can be explained, I think, relatively simply, even though the maths, especially for the general relativity, is, is quite hard. Special relativity is not that hard, actually. All right, uh, thanks. Thanks for listening. Any questions? How do they slow the clocks or speed them up? Sorry? How do they slow the clocks or speed them up? So they, they, uh, they slow them down before they launch them. So they calibrate these atomic clocks. Yeah, so just a calibration. Like, you know, a, a second is defined to be 9,473,000. There's some, there's some number of oscillations which is defined to be a second by common agreement. But the actual, the actual sesium oscillations are very, very fast. So just, just take a, a smaller number of them and call that a new second. All right, so thank you all for coming. Thank you again for coming, and good luck in your next year, and good luck with the students. Thank you.